Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Modeling Data Governance, sponsored by IDERA. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Kim Brushaver. Kim is the Senior Product Manager for ER Studio Business Architect at IDERA. Kim has over 20 years of experience as a business analyst, software developer, product manager, and IT executive. Kim also enjoys working as a translator between the business and the technical teams in an organization. And with that, I will turn it over to Kim to get us started. Hello and welcome. Hi. Thank you again for having us. I'm excited to talk about this topic today, um, and we'll be covering why uh, you should be doing business process models in order to outline your data governance program. Um, <clears throat> so um, I like to always start my uh, sections with uh, quotes. So one of the ones I picked for today is, War is 90% Information by Napoleon Bonaparte. And without data, you're just another person with an opinion. So what is data governance? Data governance is the fine art of defining your data, modeling your data, ensuring the quality of your data, tracking your data, knowing who is access accessing your data, protecting your data, meeting your and meeting your regulatory guidelines. And here I've thrown up a few of the standard regulatory guidelines that a lot of people are looking at in regards to data. Of course, there's um, security-oriented regulatory standards. There are, um, you know, other standards that your organization might be held accountable to. But it's very important to be looking at what those standards are asking you to do in regards to your data governance process. So data is not information. Information is not in knowledge. Knowledge is not understanding, and understanding is not wisdom. And if we have data, let's look at the data. If all we have are opinions, let's go with mine. So these are kind of some fun chuckles along the way. <clears throat> so how business process modeling can help. When you start uh, talking between the business side and the technical side, there's a lot of jargon that takes place. And the business side has a lot of focus on one side of the, the world. And the technical side has a lot of other different objectives and priorities that they're trying to reach. And when you are speaking in your native tongue, then you tend to get a lot of different words thrown back and forth. And some of those words may not be as um, understandable to some of the people that you're trying to talk to. So having a good picture in place where both sides can understand what they're doing is um, really helpful. So I'm going to play a little bit first before we get into the nitty gritty details. So let's imagine a dog grooming studio. In this case, my story is Fluffy Paws, the dog grooming studio, is the perfect place to bring your special fur babies. We know how important your dog is to you, and we want to ensure that they are treated like the prince and princess that they are. We offer baths, nail trimming, haircuts, de-shedding, and flea treatments. So when I tell you that story, it brings up an image in your mind. Whether you have a dog or you don't have a dog and you've been to a dog groomer before or you haven't, you have a picture that comes to mind. So your picture could be something like this or maybe this or maybe this. But ultimately, we all have different pictures we've dreamed up in our heads, and when you can actually display the picture, then it helps to get everybody on board and speaking the same language and, and dealing with the same thing. So pictures aren't just worth a thousand words. They enhance the story. They communicate a vision. <clears throat> they can be language and jargon agnostic. They clarify the points that you're trying to make. So why not use pictures instead of words when you're describing a business? Uh, if you were trying to gather requirements, the client might say, I need an application that will help me run my dog grooming studio. And 
you know, if you're just using your words, then it's like, okay, so the application needs to schedule appointments, check in, check out dogs, charge the customer, and you as a good developer could be thinking in regards to appointments. Well, how is this appointment scheduled? What information is needed for the appointment? What kinds of services are offered? What information do we need to capture on the dog? What information do we need to capture on the owner? And do we want to retain information for recurring customers that might come back? Additionally, when you're thinking about the check-in and check-out process, you could be thinking about questions of how do I check in or check out the dogs? How do I build the customer? Are there specials, coupons? Do we want to give paper receipts or emails? Do we want to contact the customer later? Do we want to track information and understand the business analytics? And you have a lot of different questions that all come to be on that simple statement that just says, I need to my application to do three things. And a whole conversation can start to take place just on those words. And your customers' responses may vary. They may give you no information when you, you ask those questions. You're the expert. You're supposed to figure this out. <clears throat> they may give you very vague information. They simply respond to your questions, but they give you no additional information, just yes or no answers. They may give you too much information, technical manuals or 100-page business requirements that go into painful detail about everything you need to know and a whole lot of information that you don't that's not really important to the conversation. So pictures allow you to easily communicate and, and interact with your not-so-technical boss, your coworkers, your clients, your customers, and that's the gist of this conversation that I'm jumping into. So for example, if we were putting together a really basic business process for grooming, we know we want to schedule the appointment, we know we want to check in the dog, we know we want to groom the dog, and we know we want to check out the dog. And from that, we can start to build out some more in-depth processes. So in this case, if we're going to break down scheduling appointment, we can start to talk about what type of dog is it, what type of services, what information are we going to collect about the dog, what information are we going to collect about the owners, and, and then, you know, maybe start to schedule the appointment. And if you lay it out here, you've got your tables already defined, you've got your fields already defined. <clears throat> you can start to talk about additional tables that you might need, and you can start to have this conversation, even with somebody who's a dog groomer, they can look at this, this business process and understand these are the elements that I need to run my business, and on the data side, you can look at these and say these are the elements that I need to build in order to build this application. And so business process diagrams are really powerful and can be really great at getting those conversations started and talking to people and having them talk through the processes without a lot of paragraphs of manuals or a lot of dead stares. So business process models, pictures can save the day. And sometimes they just make us smile. And you know, if you're not a dog person, um, I hope you would still love this little cute little smiley corgi. So <clears throat> without big data analytics, companies are blind, deaf, and wandering out onto the web like a deer on the freeway, according to Jeffrey Moore. Data that sits unused is no different from data that was never collected in the first place, which is another profound statement of when you're looking at your data and you're trying to understand it and you're trying to get people to come on board with what you're trying to accomplish, um, Obviously, you want to be able to use as much of that data as you have. So what does this have to do with data governance? So the reminder after my doggy distraction is that data governance involves defining your data, modeling your data, ensuring the quality of your data, tracking your data, know who's accessing your data, protecting it, and meeting your regulation guidelines. So in these next steps, I will go in and I will um, break down each of these little bullets separately. I will then show you a business process diagram that is meant to uh, help facilitate the conversation between people, and then I'll show uh, additional examples after that of, you know, breaking down a piece of that conversation so that you can start to think about how you might want to build your own business process diagrams to get conversations in your organization going regarding all of the different elements of data governance. 
So when you're defining your data, the things that you might be thinking about are, how do you define those data elements? Are your data definitions consistent across the organization? What is the lexicon and jargon that you're choosing to use? And how is that data mapped to other systems? So here's a really high level business process. I kept all of these, with the exception of one, at an extremely high level just because um, <clears throat> I didn't want you to spend a lot of time looking at the details, but instead just understand the concept. So in this case, we could break down all of the different tasks that are needed in order to um, look at your data definition process. And these are a lot of the same questions that I asked before, but as you see, you're able to drop down, you know, okay, so when I create and communicate data standards, data standards are gonna fall out of that process. And when I set up a committee to create the data dictionary, I know that I need to, to find some stewards or some people to be part of that committee. And then I need to cr have a result that drops out of it that's called the data dictionary. So of course you can um, add other artifacts that drop down during the process. You can deep dive into any of these particular elements and to be able to really understand and have this conversation. But if you go to a business user and you show them a picture like this and say, this is the conversation we're gonna have today, they can really understand the flow of the conversation and the elements that are trying to be covered without trying to write some sort of several step outline or document or requirements to be able to dig in deeper on these details. So this is a data mapping example, and again, very high level. So I've sat and said, okay, I've got a web system, I've got a retail system. My two tables may be completely different uh, names in different places, but I wanna start to show how that information is gonna get mapped between one side and the other. And of course, as a DBA, you're gonna get into far more complex meta details about all of this information. But when you're talking to the business side and you're showing these business pictures, these kinds of things can be really really helpful and they can really think about it so your web guys and your retail guys go oh, you know we are capturing the same information or maybe we're not maybe there's a reason why order and purchase are completely different and why they're different in one system and the other and and maybe um, they are they need to be handled separately or maybe they can be combined together or maybe there's some best practices but this can start the conversation so that they know I've got all of these systems that need to be able to map together and come together. So the next element is modeling your data. So what does your data look like? How many fields and tables are you trying to capture? Which of your data is informational? Which is used purely by the system? What metadata do you want to capture? Can you consolidate redundant data? You know, what is the data, which of your data is sensitive and protected? So again, I've gone through this process, and of course, if there's Q&A at the end, I can drive back to any of these to look at greater detail. But in this case, I've said, okay, this is my, am I starting from scratch or am I not starting from scratch? If I am starting from scratch, then I need to meet with the team, develop a conceptual model, create the data model. And you can see my artifact of the data model hanging out there. You can also, uh, from that point, once the data model is created, you can review the fields and tables in it. You can identify your informational data, your system data, your metadata, your personally identifiable information, which is, extremely important now with GDPR coming online here in three days and, and all of the implications that that's going to mean and, uh, and being able to consolidate all of your redundant data. And when you talk through this process and you deliver this process to the business side, everybody can get online and say, okay, so whenever I've got new data that needs to be modeled, we're gonna go through this process. And this is the process that we follow. And of course, if, I'm, if there are any elements missing or need to be changed in order, you can quickly and easily do that with a business process model. So in this case, I've just outlined what you might wanna do if you're like bucketing. So you say, okay, these are my tables that contain personally identifiable information. This group um, has informational data, but it's not personally identifiable information. And then I've got some um, data that's my system data and be able to start really talking about that, thinking it through, talking to your business users and having them understand, you know, what information is gonna be subject to regulations and guidelines and what information isn't. 
So the next aspect is ensuring the quality of your data. So how do you measure the quality of your data? And what is the current condition of that data? Are there any places where data may be unreliable? How accurate does your data need to be? How do you identify that there's an issue with your data? How do you fix the data that may be inaccurate? And how do you create parameters that are consistent and repeatable? So here I've mapped out a potential data quality process. So in this case, we say, okay, so how do we plan to measure it? And, and how are we collecting the data, storing the data, cleansing the data, processing the data? Those may be elements that you say, we need to go into detail and we need to discuss those further when we're um, talking about them. Um, for data profiling, what is the current state of our data? And it may be, you know, that a DBA is involved in, in being able to really look at that and understand that. Um, what might our data, where might our data be unreliable? Again, you may have your DBAs looking at it and determining, you know, this, these are the places where we need to improve in some quality. So the next one is how accurate does our data need to be? And then how do we identify data issues? And so in this case, I've dropped down an artifact for a data action committee because I think it is helpful to have a group of people within your organization that can make decisions on the quality of your data and help you to really understand, um, you know, what actions do we need to take? Is this something that we need to go back and, and make it more accurate? Do we need to make it more reliable? Or is this an aspect of data that maybe doesn't need to be as reliable as others? Um, and then I've got how do, we plan, how do we plan to fix the inaccurate data? How do we create parameters that are consistent and repeatable? And so an artifact that might fall out of that would be data quality parameters. And how do we handle data errors? And again, an, an element on how those data errors might happen uh, could fall out of that. And based on this, you can go into that conversation with your business users. You know, you know that you're going to be discussing all these topics. It's a quick, easy way to be able to do an agenda and an outline. And everybody knows at the end of the day, there's assignments that are going to be made. There are groups that are going to need to come together. There are parameters that need to be defined. There are, um, you know, deliverables that are going to fall out of that meeting. And so this is a really quick and easy way for people to be able to know and see the responsibilities that they might have. So in this case, I've decided to go with the fixing the incorrect data. And uh, I've gone through and said, okay, so we might identify our inaccurate data. Then we need to decide what's the cause of it. Is the data poorly defined in the first place? Is it incomplete? Is it just out of date? Or is it completely wrong to begin with? And then if you've um, identified those known issues for the incorrect data, you could put together a quality committee that decides, okay, so based on these factors that have come in, what's the most important to address? How severe is it? What is the priority on getting those things done? And having those kinds of conversations within the committee. Then of course, at intervals that you define, you'll fix the data, and then you'll determine how those issues can be prevented in the future. Again, this is a great conversation to be able to have with your business users where they can really quickly and easily understand the elements that are in play and the important issues in order to make sure that the data is correct and accurate and of high quality. So in tracking your data, so questions that might come up would be, where does your data go? And when does the data come into your system? Where does data leave your system? How can the data be used? What does the data create and what does it consume? And what, does, what rules do your does your data follow? So in the data tracking process, you might look at, again, where does it go? Where does it come from? Where does it leave? In this case, I really kind of did just a straight conversational, okay, these are the questions that we need to address within our um, business team and say, you know, where are all these places that data is going to come and go from and, and how am I going to keep track of it and, and really important elements in tracking that data and making sure you understand the lineage and you know where it comes in and, and where it gets changed and where it might get, uh, where it might go back out of the system, which is important to track. 
so here we've got a process diagram on order tracking. And this case, you might have an order entry system that then checks inventory, that confirms your order, that prefer, prepares your customer bill, and asks if that inventory is available. If so, it'll place it, uh, it'll fulfill the order. If not, it places it on back order, and it'll ship the order. In this case, I'm able to really quickly see, okay, so I have to have a table for available inventory. I have to have one for customer order info. When I'm dealing at looking at this, I've got four different applications that are all tracking between my inventory systems, my order entry system, my billing system, and my shipping system. And all of these are going to be changing and altering, especially my customer order info as the status goes on. So looking at that kind of information and really being able to um, get in and track that data and understand its, its path through the whole product. So the next element is knowing who's accessing your data. So who can access your data? Who can influence your data? Do they have full access or can they just access some of the data? Do they have read access or can they update the data? And how is your data stored? So again, We'll look at who can access it, who can influence it, do they have the full access, and, and these diamonds are represented as decision points so that there's a conversation that needs to be had that says, okay, so based on the way that I, de I make a decision path, what, how does the behavior change? And in this case, I may have my DBA, my system admin, my network admins, my solutions architects, and, um, and they you know, all have different responses to all these questions, and I need to know how does that access change and what is what information needs to be tracked. So in this case, I've gone through and I've identified a few different ways that you might be able to say, okay, so I've got, you know, one person that has access to my financial data, and I need to lock that down for just that person to have access. Um, and maybe I've got military and government data and I've got somebody else that's responsible for tracking that, my personal health data, my private individual data, and then the rest of the data might be available and open to the entire data team and being able to start to really have those conversations. The other thing that having this kind of a diagram helps you to understand is um, when I've got an issue that comes up in regards to financial data, then I know who I can go back to to talk to about the data. And, um, and I also can, you know, lock down that only Quacky McDuck gets to see that financial data. And, and having those business conversations to make sure that everybody's on board and agrees that certain people have access so that when you lock it down, there's not a lot of people who start to complain. They're like, why don't I have access to this information? I had access to this information yesterday and now I don't. And so if you can lay out one of these things with your business team, then they understand, you know, you don't get access to this anymore because only this person or this team or this group can have access. And this is an example of maybe a data archiving process. So you might say, okay, so I've got four, three different data stores. One's my inventory tracking, one's my online orders, one's my data warehouse. And after a certain amount of time, that information gets placed in other places. So after 90 days, my um, orders and inventory may go, um, my inventory may go to the data warehouse, but I have to archive the order. And then after six months, I archive the inventory. And being able to have these conversations of after how much time does my data transfer to one place or another. Another element is protecting your data. So how is your data protected? Is your data encrypted or is it masked? And what do you do in the case of a data breach? And this is really going to become very important, especially with GDPR coming, because with GDPR, they're saying that you need to be able to notify within 72 hours that a breach has occurred on your system. And I think that definitely there are lots of people who are scrambling to meet this requirement because it may be 
several weeks before they notice that someone has gotten in and, and had access. And being able to put these kinds of processes in place in advance helps you to be able to really quickly detect an issue that's come up and understand um, everybody on the team, understand how you're supposed to respond so that it can be addressed quickly. So here, again, you might be talking about, well, how do we protect our data? Do we, um, do we protect it via backups, mirroring, snapshots, disaster recovery? Um, that's a big element. While it's not data breach, it's an understanding of what am I going to do with my data and how am I going to store it off? And having those conversations with your teams to understand so that everybody knows in case you get hit by a bus, Everybody knows exactly where the data is being protected and how it's being protected and how to recover it if something were to happen. The other aspect is understanding what data needs to be encrypted or masked. Is it personal data, logins, financial info, systems, and what will we do in the case of a breach? So this is from one of my documents that I've done in regards to GDPR. And you've got, you know, process documents that need to be followed, you've got regulations that are, are impacting your, um, your processes, you, you have to, you know, check the current procedures of data protection, are you in compliance, if so, you would report to management, if not, you need to inform the owners and update and publish the procedures, um, you may have data owners that are involved or data protection officers, and if you tried to explain this in words, it could become a really quick jumbled mess, but when you can clearly put it in a process diagram where you've got arrows that are connecting to various different places, then you can really kind of start to um, have this conversation in a way that flows a lot better and that's um, a lot more helpful for both the business and the data side to understand. And in this case, this is a really high level um, quick data breach steps document. So the instance gets reported, you gather the preliminary details, you confiscate or shut down the hardware, you investigate the threats, you determine if there was threat, if, I mean, any theft. If so, you notify the management team. If not, you might file a report. And so being able to put those pieces together and be able to really quickly say, okay, this is what happens. If you've not noticed a breach, then you need to follow these processes. And that way it's, hap it's repeated every single time and it's very clear exactly what you need to do. So the last aspect of data governance that I wanted to cover in this conversation is meeting your regulatory guidelines and understanding what guidelines do you have to meet, how is your data impacted by those guidelines, and what do the guidelines require you to do. So here I've dropped out again, if you notice some little artifacts where you have to determine which regulations you're going to follow, and that may be um, a number of regulatory guidelines that come together. You need to alert your organization on what you're going to do in order to become compliant. You, so that if anybody asks that needs to know that information, then everybody knows and everybody's online with it. You need to determine which of your data is impacted because with every regulation, there's lots of data that's not impacted and there's lots of data that is and being able to really understand what that impacted data is and have that conversation with your team. Determining policies that need adjustment. Uh, sometimes these regulations will come in. There's a lot of people right now that are scrambling, um, trying to understand what does it mean if a customer, if a, if somebody is asking to be removed from um, existence, and how does that affect all of my different data, and how does that affect, you know, policies down the road that are saying, you know, normally if I if somebody wants to just you know, be left off the list, I do this, but if they want to be ignored completely, like where do my other systems get messed up in that process? Um, defining a compliance committee is really important so that anytime new data issues come up, there's a compliance committee to be able to have that conversation and determine, okay, so based on the fact that we're following HIPAA compliance, you know, what does that mean for my data? Or I'm following PCI compliance, what does that mean for my data? Um, determining the organizational impact. In some companies, they are completely prepared for this already. They've been dealing with 
um, SOCs or PCI or HIPAA for some time and they're already good to go. In other organizations, bringing in a regulation um, will completely upset the organization and you may have to decide, okay, I'm going to do baby steps and I'm going to address these elements at this point and these other elements at another point. Um, you would then go through, once you've decided when you're going to implement those steps, you'd implement the updates and you would audit your data and policies. So I promised you a really nice complicated um, process. <clears throat> this is the process that we have for one of our um, GDPR models. Um, obviously, I don't expect you to be able to read all these tiny little blue and red words, but you can certainly build a process diagram that has a lot of complexity to it, that has a lot of notes in it that say, okay, these are the things that we need to be talking about and all the elements we need to be considering in regards to um, each of the different items that need to be addressed and need to be talked about. So in conclusion, it's important to define your data governance processes so everyone is on the same page. A good data governance will help you demonstrate compliance for those pesky regulations. And business process models pictures can make collaboration um, a lot easier. And I purposefully kept this conversation a little bit shorter because I thought that the questions that you guys might have um, would drive a lot more of the conversation in, in regards to the issues you guys are having in modeling your data governance. Um, so at this point, I'm willing to open the conversation up for, uh, and I'll be happy to go back to any of the slides that I referenced. Kim, thank you so much for another great presentation. We've got questions coming in. If you have questions, submit them in the Q&A section in the bottom right-hand corner. And just to ask the most, or answer the most commonly asked question, uh, just a reminder, I will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides, the recording, and anything else requested throughout. So diving right in here, Kim, um, could you describe your governance structure for uh, a little for decision-making? Yeah, so... Um Trying to think of which slide might showcase that best. Um, let me go back to my schedule appointment one. So each time that, like I said, you've got these diamonds um, in your business process models that are a decision point. And when you're modeling out these processes, when you put those decision points in, then it's a point where everybody that is in a meeting or in a conversation knows we need to make a decision about this. And in this case, I guess it's not that big a deal. It's just trying to determine what the breeds are and the services. But as you're going through, it's like, okay, so we know that the, the, the rectangles are the tasks that need to be accomplished, the activities, the conversations that need to be taken place. But when you're really starting to drive into those questions, you can start to put in your business process models that I've got a decision and I maybe I know on one half of the question which direction I'm going to go in and maybe I don't for the other. And so I could draw a line down, do a big question mark and say, okay, I know that, um, you know, if I want to do this type of service, I'm going to go this direction. But if I have another service, I may have to go off another direction. And I don't know what that direction is. And so you can start to have those conversations with your your users. I've had cases where, you know, I've been talking to, for example, the sales team about their um, contact process. And they give me this list of the listed processes that they already have and everybody's following them and they know that's the way they're supposed to do it. And when I drew it out into a business process model, it was very clear that there were decision points that, that weren't documented. And it meant that if a salesperson was on a call and they got to that point in the process, they wouldn't know what to do with it. And the, because it was written out in words, it wasn't clear where the process flow went. And so we were able to go and say, oh, well, in the case of, you know, maybe it's, all right, so I just got off the call with a customer. Let me jot down this information that I collected. Well, what if I didn't collect any information? 
And they're like, well, I don't know. We hadn't really thought about that. And I'm like, okay, so, you know, does that mean that they go back and set up another call? Does that mean, you know, what happens if they got a voicemail? You know, what's the process in that case? And they're like, oh, I hadn't really thought about that. And I hadn't really made a decision about that. And and by drawing out your business processes in this flow, it makes it really easy to quickly catch those points where it's like, wait, here was a decision, but you only told me one half of the decision. Does that help to explain it? If not, please ask another question. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, um, I, so moving on to the next question, we'll see if the um, question, original questioner has additional questions. Have you had experience creating a detailed conceptual data model as a guideline for the enterprise? If so, how was it received and used? Yeah, so um, the, the IDERA Business Architect product does both the um, business process models and the conceptual models. And I have uh, worked uh, with people on projects where they do draw out the full conceptual model that has all of the business entities and the business elements and everything else in it. Um, and we, you know, we got down to the full entity conversation. We broke them up into chunks of functionality. I don't have an example in this presentation where we covered that. Um, I don't think I even have a conceptual model in here. Um, I guess I could kind of talk from 51 where, you know, you start to kind of group them out and, you know, you can create your big old bubbles, your subject areas and talk them through and start to create those and say, okay, so these are, these are my tables that I plan. These are the entities that I plan. This is what I intend to call them. Um, sometimes what's in the data is not the same as what's in, you know, the application, but being able to really have those conversations and draw them out and um, let them come out. They, I'm, I'm sorry that I don't have an example right here, but, um, but certainly you can start to really find them down. And with our product, you can take those conceptual models and take the data elements that you've created and dump them directly into our data modeling product, ER Studio Data Architect. So you have, uh, you put forth a very interesting approach to having a com the conversation with your business customer. Have you gone deeper using uh, IDEF1 or OV-5V type of data modeling? I have not, and those terms are not something that I'm aware of. Um, I could probably do a really quick Google search on it, but um, that it doesn't mean that we don't cover it. I just don't, I'm not familiar with those terms. Hopefully I even pronounced them correctly. <laughs> I, <admit> I, <laughs> I, do, I do apologize. I am not omniscient. I am not all-knowing. <laughs> but certainly, um, if you'd like to tweet that to me, I can certainly go and research it, and um, and I can get back to you with an answer after the fact. My, I love uh, it. My Twitter is breastshaber underscore idera. So if Perfect. you want to tweet it to me, I'll go look it up, and I'll find out for you. So, Kim, um, what modeling notations, for example, uh, BPMN, um, does ER Studio uh, support? Can you convert a link to, uh, can, you ver can you convert or link a BPMN model to a UML model? Can the models be linked to and from metadata repositories and development tools? So, uh, it's, we have another product that's called Software Architect that does UML modeling. Um, it's not tied directly into Business Architect, which does the business process models, um, but certainly um, you can you can make the transition. Um, sadly, you're going to have to redraw it. Um, we do allow imports in from um, Visio from the business process models. So, if you wanted to create a UML model and convert it over to a business process model in Visio, and then dump it into um, Business Architect, we could certainly start from that direction. But um, I don't really think of um, I'm trying to think of how I would go from the UML model and the use cases. Um, 
I guess I mean it just translates and that's an interesting question I may I may see about a way to be able to do that more in the future where we take those the tasks um, from the UML notation put them into tasks and business process modeling and then take all the actors from the UML and drop them in as stewards um, we don't currently do that but that is interesting and there was a second half to that question beyond I just started thinking about the UML half what is the other second part of that Shannon Yes, uh, can the uh, models be linked to uh, to and from metadata repositories and development tools? Yeah, so we do, um, Business Architect does allow, if you have Enterprise Team Edition, we have a team server product that um, that is a repository that holds both the Business Architect models as well as the um, data architect models and you can link those to, all of those elements together to and to terms or to each other um, you can definitely relate them that way um, and like I said whenever you create these um, go back just to this page whenever you create your um, data objects in business architect you can um, import those over to data architect as well and be able to use it that way now we don't we do collect some properties and some information um, but n we don't have nearly the metadata that, that the uh, data architect tool has available data architect goes into some extreme level of detail in regards to the metadata and uh, they read the questioner on the um and the uh, acronyms before uh, explains that IDF0 and IDF1 were defined by the United States Air Force, um, and those are compound acronym for ICAM definition for function modeling. Um, so we are we are learning things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I haven't really dug as much. I I spent a lot of my time. I obviously spent a lot of my time in business process world. I spent a lot of my time in compliance world. That's why I'm able to rattle off a lot of compliance stuff off the top of my head. But um, we haven't. Been, I haven't been dealing with as many of the military compliance elements at this point in time. So again, I would encourage you to send me a Twitter message and I'll be happy to circulate it around to all the other brainiacs in my organization and get an answer for you on how we relate. So Kim, what uh, tool are you using for data lineage? So our data are, so on one sense, it depends on how you define data lineage. So in this case, um, in the case of this presentation, it was really focusing on business process models and um, let me go back to like this one, um, where you can use the process models to understand how the data is going to flow through the product. Um, but again, the data architect tool is the tool that is has pretty extreme data lineage modeling capabilities in it, and um, and that's um, one of my counterparts is responsible for that product so he would be able to go much into greater detail about that um, but we do have much more in detail data lineage mapping um, that goes on in data architect uh, so can you confirm if data architect works with the business architect these two uh, products don't work with each other they do. Um, they are. We hope to have them work even more, um, uh, even more on an instant basis. But right now, you can take any of the data elements and move them from uh, Business Architect into Data Architect. You can also take any of the data elements that are in Data Architect and import them into Business Architect. Um, and additionally, like I said, there's the team server element that allows you to link these items together a lot better. We do anticipate down the road making that even more seamless, um, make it more real-time updates. Um, at, the, at the moment, it's an import and export process, but um, certainly that's a request that's come in from a lot of different people to be able to have them work more seamlessly. So uh, what do you find is the best way to get full buy-in and understanding of the necessity and benefits of data governance to senior leadership? I mean, we get this question a lot, Kim. It's, it's something that I know a, a lot of our community struggles with. 
Yeah, I think that the um, the business team looks at things obviously a lot different than the data team. I mean, the, and that's why in talking to you guys right now, you're mostly data focused, and so you look at all this and you go, well, yeah, that's a no-brainer. You know, those are the kinds of questions that I know I should be asking, and those are the kinds of things that need to come out of it. But in talking to the business users and the executive team, they really like to look at things at a much higher level. And so that's where these business processes can come in and be really helpful. Um, because you can take it up and you can take it out of the details and and start to get them to really focus in on the questions that you need to have answered. Um, additionally, I find that working with the business teams, um, they deal a lot in one of two directions. One being ROI. You know, how is this going to change the bottom line figures in what I'm trying to get to? The other one being in pain points and understanding, okay, if we don't do this, then these problems are going to occur. So when you look at, let me go back to, um, Let me go back to the slide that has all of the elements on it. So your your um, your business teams probably aren't going to care that much about defining your data, especially not at the executive level. Um, at the individual level, if they're try if they're responsible for certain things, then you know they would think it's really important to define this is how the product needs to work and this is the data I need to collect from it. But at the higher level, they're probably not going to care too much about how you define it. They're going to just say make it work. Um, modeling your data, again, this is going to be something that's going to be more at a lower level decision maker instead of the high level executive team. But when you get into ensuring the quality of your data, that is a conversation that you can easily have with your executive team and your business users because if you aren't getting, uh, a lot of us when we step into these technical roles, we are adopting um, technology from somebody else that's written it or, you know, we've been hired in and I mean, we don't have any control over it or a company is merged together with us and the data is just crazy and, and people are like, oh, just make it work and you're like, okay, but I can make it work, but that doesn't mean that the quality is there. And so I think that you definitely can have the executive conversations on, um, you know, how, when is my data considered inaccurate, or when is my data just plain wrong, and 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 how do we define what we're going to fix when? Because every whenever you're working with any kind of project you have to be able to justify, okay, I need to be changing this now and not this later. And those of us who do get into the technical details and we love the data, we are, uh, we're bothered by the fact that our data is not of the highest quality. And, you know, we're constantly fighting and we sound a little bit like Chicken Little because we keep coming up with all of these places where the data is wrong or there's bugs in the product that are causing problems and making data inconsistent or it's stored one place and not another. Other. I mean, even from the basic of I was working in JIRA the other day and all of a sudden a second resolution field came and popped up and I'm like, wait, wait, there's only one resolution to an issue. Why do I have two of these and that's going to get out of whack really quick and, and we need to fix that and repair that. And so, and, and quality of your data can definitely impact your bottom line. It can impact your customers. People can get pretty upset when your data quality is poor. So that's a pretty easy conversation to have with your business users. Um, tracking your data, maybe they don't care as much about on the executive side. Certainly the business side they do. They want to know, you know, how many hands does the data go through. Um, knowing who's accessing your data. Again, your executive team is going to be like, well, I don't know. You guys just take care of it, and that's why we have a security team. Um, so the executive teams aren't going to care as much about that. The uh, protecting your data, certainly in the case of data breach, they're going to care because of the high press that data breaches get. 
um, because of the implications that GDPR is going to have surrounding data breach, because of the financial aspects of data. Actually, I'll take back the accessing your data because of the security elements that go along with who's accessing your data. That's really important as well to, um, to executives and, and um, there's a lot who are trying to answer that question. They're like, I keep throwing money at this problem, but it doesn't go away. And so there's a lot of money in knowing who's accessing your data, protecting your data, and then meeting those regulatory guidelines as those come out and making sure that the data is there. So four of the, three of these elements are going to be really hard to have the business conversation, and especially at the executive level. Four of these are going to be really easy to address. Um, so I think that you kind of have to pick your battles and maybe you can blend in some of that that says, oh, well, you know, my data quality is poor because my data is not accurately defined. And so you may be able to kind of squeeze in some of these other data governance elements in the conversations that the business is, is interested in. Well, Kim, that's all the questions we have for right now. Let me just see if we've got any others uh, coming in. Give everyone a, just a quick moment. And again, just a reminder, I'll be sending a follow-up email by end of day Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Everyone's quiet today. I think the sun may be out everywhere, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did give people a little extra time. Normally, I only give about 15, 20 minutes at the end, so I thought that there might be a lot more questions on this, so I gave people some extra time with it today. Well, no, it's been great, Kim, and thank you so much for, for another uh, fantastic presentation, and thank you for uh, all this information. And thanks to our attendees for uh, attending and for being engaged with the questions that we did have, and I hope everyone, we'll give you all some, a few minutes back, which uh, enables you to be on time for your next meeting, which I sure know that some people will appreciate, so. <laughs> uh, thank you, Kim. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. All right, thank you.